so look, thank you for the introduction. 20 minutes, this is going to be a, a rapid ride, so um, hold on to your seatbelts. Uh, so my thanks to um, both Jonathan and to Ray. Ray has given us, I think, a snapshot of the positive understanding of marriage that's being offered through the encyclical. The uh, list of the chapters there reminds you of the different themes that Pope Francis explores. And, and one of the themes, it's only one, but it's an important one, is chapter 8. Uh, he calls it accompanying, discerning, and integrating weakness. Uh, because as we all know, we all fail to live up to the ideals of our vocations. And um, I'm sure there isn't a person in the room whose friends or family are not affected by the breakdown of marriage. So, how do we respond pastorally as a church? In this chapter 8, uh, Francis's key theme, I, th I think, is a phrase where he says, there is always a way forward. So it doesn't matter what the situation of a person's life is, no matter how, how far away they seem to be from the, the ideal of the Christian life, there is always a way forward. There is always a step to be taken. He invites people to come forward, seek out a priest or a layperson, he says. Discover how they can come to share more deeply in the life of the church. And then he has one of his wonderful understated sentences. If we do this, our lives will become wonderfully complicated. <laughs> don't you like that? Now, church leaders in particular don't like complication. So, um, as you would also know, there's been a lot of uh, discussion and controversy about what exactly Francis is saying to us in this chapter. And perhaps since I am currently have this role as Vicar General, perhaps I should say I'm not speaking today as Vicar General. Um, where I'm supposed to reflect the mind of my Archbishop, uh, and I don't know what the mind of my Archbishop is on this chapter. So um, uh, I'm speaking uh, in my own right. He says in the introduction, everyone... Um, oh, here we are. Um, yes, my slides are a bit different. So there's the sentence, 310. Um, in the introduction to the, uh, the, the letter, he says, everyone should feel challenged by chapter 8. So there's a bit of a warning. We should feel challenged by what he's got to say here. So then let's ask a few questions. Who's writing? Oops. And he's writing as a pastor. This is not a theological treatise. Um, I think Ray would probably agree. If a student handed this in as his um, license thesis, we'd, we'd probably send it back and want a few uh, different footnotes and um, a bit of tidying up. But he's writing as a pastor, as a bishop. Next question is, uh, it's an exhortation. And he's bringing together the reflections of the two synods of bishops and his own reflections. And then the important question is, what are our presuppositions as we read this document? You know, to, when the book was published and people rushed out to buy it, what were they looking for? What were they expecting? Uh, it makes a difference. Uh, and, and the fundamental difference, I think, is whether we approach this from within an allegiance to the church's teachings. So if someone already disagrees with what the church teaches in this area and then they pick this book up looking for a, a loophole that's going to support them, well, well, that's not the right way to approach it. We approach it as Catholics with allegiance to the church's teaching. But are we open then to, to development in the church's understanding, both of theology of marriage and of our sacramental discipline? Now, there's been a great debate about the, the Pope's approach, and you can summarise the debate in this way. And this is a quote from the, uh, a homily he gave just in June of this year. He says, Jesus always knows how to accompany us. He gives us the ideal. He accompanies us towards the ideal. He says, do what you can up to this point. The Lord understands us very well. Now, one of the criticisms people have made is that, that Pope Francis is reducing the church's teaching merely to ideals. You, know, you aspire to an ideal, you don't really expect to get there. And there may be perhaps a translation issue here between different cultures as to how the word ideal is understood. Uh, here's what one critic has to say. Francis turns marriage into something... Uh, we aspire to, rather than a sacramental reality we can rely on. Because one of the things you'd urge people to do is to rely on the grace of the sacrament to strengthen them in their lives. 
Whereas, as this author says, the sacrament should anchor us and, and give us stability to our fragile lives. This, this author suggests, he's an American, R.R. Uh, Reno, Francis misjudges our era. We live in a dissolving era. The problem that's not, is not that divorce is judged harshly, it's, it's that young people experience marriage as a fragile institution. So we might, we might be alert here to differences in the culture between North and South, between uh, our Anglo, basically Anglo-American culture and the way we think about laws and ideals and a more Latin culture. Uh, many of you have been to Italy, you know how traffic signs work. It's different. You, you'll be pleased to know I got booked the other day for jaywalking. And I discovered the police are having a blitz on this at the moment, so just a, a warning, you see? Now, that, that wouldn't happen in Italy, right? Okay. So there's a different way of thinking about laws and ideals, and that's part of what's going on here, which leads one author, um, John Allen, to say that, that what we've got in, the, in this letter is, uh, he said, he's, the Pope's letting the world in on the secret the secret is that while the church has a very high teaching and theology, it's also always been pastorally compassionate, chiefly through the sacrament of penance in confession. Now, there's a crisis in the West over the celebration of that sacrament. Almost disappeared in, in our parishes, as you would know. And, and so there's been a shift in the way we think about conversion and sin uh, and in our attempts to live the Christian life. So let me quickly tell you um, how I believe the Pope argues in this chapter. So he, he identifies a number of very traditional principles of Catholic moral theology. First of all, there's a difference between the objective moral norms and the, the subjective responsibility of the person. People often do bad things, but they sincerely think they're doing a good thing. So when people are doing bad things, they're doing bad things, but you can't automatically assume they're bad people. Traditional principle. The law of um, gradualism, what have we got here? Yeah, it, it takes us time to grow in moral maturity and to carry out our moral responsibilities. What he calls the priority of reinstating, uh, of translating that to say the church is not a sect. He said, look, the church is about bringing people in not about shutting people out. Mercy, in fact, is the fullness of divine justice. And we have the practice of pastoral discernment and a recognition of the primacy of conscience. So, with those traditional principles, he then begins to develop some new conclusions. I've mucked up the slides here, but that's all right. Um... Talk to Francine later. That's all right. So uh, let's go with what they've got here. So the priority of reinstating. So here are some of the new conclusions that begin to emerge. Being in an irregular situation, he says, does not equal being in a state of mortal sin. You can't draw that conclusion automatically. He uses the analogy of ecumenism with the churches. We think of the other churches, the Orthodox, the Anglican, the Protestant churches and so on. There are degrees of union. This, the church has taught the Second Vatican Council. Well, there can be degrees of moral union. You know, some people's lives who, who are not in good order, well, some are worse than others. You know? Some are closer to the ideal than others. And then he speaks about conscience seeking to know the next step. Now, here is where I believe there is something very new in this letter, which I think the theologians are yet to explore and, and perhaps to, um, to clarify. So he speaks about conscience where a person seeks to know what's the next thing I need to do if I'm going to progress on this path of moral growth. And in that path of moral growth, I need the sacraments. Which sacraments? Well, obviously... Com communion and confession. So, uh, drawing this together then, in the words of um, Cardinal Whirl, he's dropped off, but it's, uh, this is a quote from Cardinal Whirl in Washington. He says, there's a difference between the teaching on the indissolubility of marriage, which is a doctrine of the church, and the pastoral judgment about individuals' relationship to the sacraments, 
The two realities are greatly related, but they're not the same. And uh, there's a, a need here, I think, to clarify uh, a point that's made here in this chapter where he speaks about the difference between general principles and, if you like, the exceptions in particular cases. And, uh, and some critics have said, well, hang on a minute. Is he saying that adultery is sometimes right? <laughs> Uh, I, I think not. I think the clarification here is that where the exceptions come is in the relationship to the sacraments. So, so he's not saying that marriage is not indissoluble. But the question of a person's admission to the sacraments, that's a bit more complicated. So moving then to sacraments, and the, the hot-button question, of course, has always been the, um, the question of admission to Eucharist. And, uh, and this is a point, I think, which might be drawn out a little bit more than it is in the, uh, in the letter. But think about it. This is an issue for every Catholic. Holy Communion, receiving Holy Communion has many aspects. It's food for the journey, it's reconciliation, it's forgiveness of our sins, it's unity and so on. It's not reserved for the perfect. And that's something Pope Francis liked to remind, likes to remind us of. But on the other hand, it's not to be taken lightly. You know, before we receive communion, we say, Lord, I am not worthy. And so, whatever our situation in life is, but, but one of those situations might be that a person is divorced and uh, wishes to remarry, one of the questions then is, well, what, what are the implications of this for respect for the sacraments? How do I respect the sacramental discipline of the church? Uh, the particular question is, does my previous marriage still bind me sacramentally? And we know, of course, that it, in lots of situations it doesn't. You know the standard joke these days. A couple arrive at the door of the church and uh, say they wish to get married. And the first question the priest should ask is, well, that's nice, but have you been married before? And they say, well, yes, we have. And you say, well, where was that? And they say, well, that one was in Bali and the other was on the beach out at Bondi. And the priest says, oh, that's all right. Thank God for that. Okay, fill in the forms, away we go. No problems. <laughs> right? The truth is we've got a very irregular and inconsistent jurisdiction, uh, jurisprudence in, in relation to these questions. S but the question's a real one. Am I bound by my previous sacramental marriage? And, uh, and an obvious step is for a person to approach the church's tribunal and uh, to seek to have a judgment on that question. But let's come then to this issue of um, pastoral discernment. So the, the, the implication seems, seems to be, because, and I think it's a weakness of this chapter, that it, it doesn't cross-reference the work of the church tribunal. But, so the assumption seems to be that here a priest is, is seeking to help someone uh, who either has been to a tribunal without success or is not able to get to a tribunal. So let's suppose you're a, in a poor village hundreds of miles from Buenos Aires. You know, how do you approach the tribunal? Well, you can't. So clearly there's got to be another way. That's what Francis says. And there would be analogies in our culture as well. So um, a few thoughts then on this pastoral discernment. Uh, and uh, I saw, heard of someone quoting a bishop in England recently. How would he respond in this situation? He said, well, the first thing I'd say is, do, do you go to Mass? <laughs> Let's start there. So, so there's, no, there's no open slather here which says, look, um, yes, it's fine, you can be divorced one week and remarried the next and front up to communion the week after. There's no opening for that, that, that silliness at all. It's, it's a serious discernment of the person's life and their situation, their desire to God, their desire for renewal. The question is, what must I do? You know, how to, what, if I'm open to the gospel and the church's teaching, what are the implications of that? Am I willing to change? I mean, you can think of many situations where a person, if they examine their own conscience, would think to themselves, gosh, you know, I, I sinned grievously in causing the breakdown of my marriage. I should not front up to Holy Communion as if, as if nothing's happened. Yeah? That, Surely that would be a sound conscience judgment in many cases. But not all cases are like that. And you can imagine all sorts of other cases. And the question he says is, what, what is the next step that a person must take? 
and the question they ask themselves. Now, he's got a description there of pastoral discernment, which some of the critics have said is a bit unrealistic. See what you think. He says, when a responsible and tactful person who doesn't presume to put his own desires ahead of the common good of the church meets with a pastor, acknowledges the seriousness of the matter before him, there can be no risk of a specific discernment to leading people to think the church maintains a double standard. Perhaps that's a bit idealistic. Um, well, perhaps the Pope believes in the Holy Spirit uh, and that the seriousness with, with which we approach these issues. So, the, 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 um, look, if you want the summary of, of the, the practical teaching here, the, there is no change to the general disciplinary rule that if I'm bound by a sacramental marriage and I enter into another marriage, that that's a serious situation which puts me at odds with the, the communion of the church. There's no change in that general principle at all. But does it mean that in some particular cases there are not situations where a person says, look, this is the best I can do. I cannot return to the former marriage. I have no obligations anymore to my former partner. I'm meeting what obligations I have to my children. I'm not able to uh, approach the church's tribunal or I, I haven't succeeded in doing that, uh, and so on. There may well be situations. Now, what's really new here? And uh, I'll be interested perhaps in discussion to see what Ray makes of this. But it seems to me what is in these next couple of quotes is something dramatically new in the pastoral practice of the church. So Francis speaks of a gradualness in the prudential exercise of free acts on the part of the subject who's not in a position to understand, appreciate or fully carry out the objective demands of the law. He says the law can be followed with the help of grace even though each human being advances gradually with the progressive integration of the gifts of God. Another one. Conscience can recognise with sincerity and honesty what for now is the most generous response which can be given to God and come to see with a certain moral security that, that it's what God himself is asking amid the concrete complexity of one's limits while not yet fully the objective ideal. Um, now, as far as I know, that's radically new. Or at least it's the first time we've ever put it in print. It's probably what priests have been doing in the confessional for 500 years. But we've kept it a secret. Because the truth is we, we are all struggling to aspire to live out the truth. And nobody in this room, none of us is getting 10 out of 10. That's the truth. Uh, and, and the honest thing to say is, here I am, Lord, I'm a sinner. And uh, I'd like to um, validate this, if I might. Uh, there's another one. Right, okay. Uh, I'd like to valid validate, I think it's a kind of validation from our spiritual tradition. In our, so if you read now, if we switch now from the... Um, the Pope's letter to our spiritual writers at their best. The tradition holds that humility is the basis for moral growth and discipleship. Grace, grace is most powerful when we acknowledge our weakness. And um, here I have a little connection with Jonathan's, the final paragraph of Jonathan's talk. He spoke about dependence. Yeah? It's at the moment when I say, I can't do it. I can't continue in my marriage. How many of you as married couples reached a point in your marriage, the honeymoon's over, boredom set in, you wake up one day and you think, what the hell am I doing here with this person? Uh, Lord, I can't do this. Our tradition says that is the moment of grace. Now, we find this hard to uh, acknowledge in our culture because we live in a culture of self-justification. We don't like to be weak. So, in, in all sorts of areas, we say, no, it's not a sin. The right answer would be to say, yes, it's a sin, but I'm weak. Um, 
Remember when they were interviewing Pope Francis, they said, who are you, Francis? He said, I'm a sinner. An amazing answer. Like he meant it. You or I wouldn't give that as our first answer. Here's a quote from um, uh, André Luf. Now, Luf is one of the great spiritual writers of the, the past uh, century. Uh, Cistercian monk. He was the abbot general of the Cistercians. You can Google him and um, see him on YouTube too if you, uh, if you speak Dutch. Now, uh, I recommend his book, Tuning Into Grace, but th this was written earlier than that in an article, Humility and Obedience in the Monastic Tradition. And he's speaking about this context. He says, today we say that's not a sin. Rome reacts setting out objective norms, saying what, not only what may be, but what must be. Humana Vita is published. Huh? And we all feel this doesn't apply to us. He says, the weakness in this case lies in the fact that today no one makes the type of confession the publican made. I am not yet so far advanced. I can't yet really achieve this. I must yet a while hold to my weakness and God will then grant me the grace. But no, he says, today we react neurotically and say that's not a sin. Okay, so um, my proposal is that it's, the, it's what the Pope here refers to as the logic of mercy and grace. That's the key to understanding the logic of the pastoral discernment. And this is a slightly different kind of logic to the logic of pure systematic theology. It's the logic of how we move from where we really are to where we're aspiring to be. We can only do that under the power of grace. It's the crisis that brings us to open ourselves to that, to that source of grace. The secular analogy is the 12-step program. It's the point when the person says, I've got a problem. I can't solve it. That's the moment of grace. I think we need that logic of grace to make sense of what the Pope is saying to us about conscience discerning the next step forward. Thank you.